In this session of the Purple Coffee Podcast, I speak to Ross Kemp about being prepared for absolutely anything at any given time. Ole. Welcome to session 16 of the Purple Coffee Podcast, inspiring stories from creative entrepreneurs. I am your host, Turndog, and in this edition, I speak to the wonderful Ross Kemp. And no, not the guy who used to be on EastEnders and who now spends his time interviewing people in war zones. Different guy, guys, different guy. Oh yes, Ross Kemp is one of Britain's brightest young entrepreneurs, has appeared on TV, he's always asked to appear on new shows, and is just a young go-getter who I'm proud to have in my little black book of creative entrepreneurs. So what on earth is this all about? Well, I interviewed him for my book, The Successful Mistake, and asked him to reveal his greatest ever mistake and how he overcame it. And on this occasion, Ross talked about not being prepared for the big picture. Now, this is something I come across all the time because we never know when we'll go viral or when that big opportunity arise. It might happen when you're sat on a plane or having a meal one day. And if you're not ready for it, you can waste it rather easily. Now, Ross has appeared on a few rather big British entrepreneurial type shows. He's met Richard Branson. And when the opportunity came, he didn't necessarily take it with two open hands. He talked about different kinds of stories and it wasn't until he took a step back and thought about the big picture and his business and how he wanted as an individual to come across that it all clicked into place. So I'm going to get straight into Ross's interview because it's a fantastic one and I'm excited to share his juicy insight with you. But first you may be wondering who this Ross Kemp fellow is. Well, I thought about sharing his about page, but I was like, no, everybody does that. So I created a little story in a way only I can. So I'm going to read off my trusty little iPhone here and share a little insight into the world of Ross. <clears throat> they may make a new series of Baywatch when Ross Kemp unleashes his creation on the world. Forget about those weird orange inflatable things the Hoff and Pam used to cart around. We aren't in the 90s anymore, folks. And Ross has covered, so don't you worry, because he's invented a powered boat, come surfboard, come rescue device, come lovely piece of awesome that's ready to disrupt beaches everywhere. Of course, Ross is much more than ASAP Watercrafts because he just so happens to be one of Britain's hottest young entrepreneurs. If you haven't heard of him yet, you should. And don't worry, in a few years' time, you'll be able to bask in the pub and say, Oh, him? Yeah. I heard of him, like, years ago. Come on, bro. Get with the times. The future Hoff? Yeah, I can see it. Be ready to fall in love, ladies and gentlemen, because here is Ross Kemp. I'm delighted to be joined this morning by Ross Kemp from ASAP Watercrafts. And he's kindly enough um, agreed to be interviewed about the mistakes he's made, but then how he's overcome them and turned them around into doing what he's doing today, which is very exciting. He's had an exceptional last year or two. So, Ross, first of all, thank you very much for joining me today. That's okay, no problems. And to begin with, let's start by just explaining who you are, what it is that you do, and what you do at ASAP. Okay, my name is Ross Kemp, and I, as part of my university course, I invented a small electric-powered watercraft for lifeguards. Um, and then once I graduated there, the university loved it, wanted me to keep working on it, backed me. Um, and then really from there, um, we ended up going on, on Be Your Own Boss, the TV show, pitching to Richard Reed and Richard Branson, which is absolutely amazing. Um, and really from that TV show, um, everything has kicked off with the business. We've created it into a business. We're now developing the product further. 
and we're looking to take it into manufacture at the end of this year so we can start selling them the next year. Um, so it's really been from from Be Your Own Boss on, on the TV that we've had loads of interest from potential investors, people who want to help us manufacture the product and get it from where we are now as a, a, as a developed product to, uh, to a product which we can sell and help people save more lives because that's, that's what it's all been about really. Fantastic. And for those who don't know, Be Your Own Boss is a entrepreneur TV show on the BBC which looks at young entrepreneurs getting it done and it is a fantastic series I saw a few of the episodes very exciting tell us a little bit about the product because it's quite innovative I, I can imagine it being you know when when America no doubt will bring back the new version of B Baywatch which will probably happen at some point <laughs> I can imagine you know the next David Hasselhoff riding around the um, California ways with one of your products Definitely, yeah, and, and we we're trying to we're trying to make the product a bit sexy as well, if we can. Um, the it's an alternative to a jet ski for lifeguards, um, but not just for lifeguards, for any other rescue in the water as well. So, for example, we've had interest from from fire and rescue services. Um, so it's it's a small electric watercraft, um, which uh, a lifeguard or rescuer can throw in the water and launch by themselves and get out to casualties in close shore rescue as soon as possible really um, and the, the whole idea was to create something which was more sustainable and easier to launch than a jet ski. Jet skis are really expensive to buy and to run and they also take two people to launch off the back of a trailer and they're, they're not fast launching um, vehicles and they're also two stroke high revving engines so they're super expensive to run and put loads of petrol in them. So we were after creating something which you could charge in the sun as it's sitting on the beach all day and then um, gives you that electric power out to the rescue and, and patrolling in the water really. Um, and from, from my point of view I always wanted to um, design something which would be fun and which would mean playing around in the water and, and, and we're, we're looking to launch it as a, as a leisure craft as well but after that initial focus of, of the rescue. Um, rescue market. So, one of one of the biggest challenges is that our market is bigger away from the UK. Mm. So, it, um, we're looking at the moment how we're we're going to be relocating to to other parts of the world and selling internationally, um, where the market is a lot bigger. So, it's yeah, it's it's a really exciting time at the moment because we're. We've still got a little way to go with, with finishing the product um, and then, then we'll be ready to, to set up the manufacture. It is all very exciting. I encourage you to take a look at the links below. It's a very fun product. I, I, I would love to get on one one day. It does look very fun. And I must say, I'm always interested to speak to manufactured-based businesses because it's, it's a world that up until recently I didn't understand until I started working with a client or two. You don't understand just how deep manufacturing process everything from the patented side to you know getting the, the electronics sorted out where just one tiny little error can result in weeks or months of playing around and stall 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 exactly. and the manufacturing side is such a big thing it's one thing <laughs> launching a, a business on the internet these days where you can be set up in a week or two but with the manufacturing process it's expensive it's long and I know from my experiences it's rough rife with um issues and potential pitfalls so I'm sure you've come across some rather interesting obstacles along the way. Definitely and I mean um, in product development you need so much money in the first place to put in. You mentioned there an, an internet startup or, um, or something similar to that which you can set up over a weekend and then be trading on the Monday um, whereas when you're developing a product you have to keep plowing money into it and time as well um, with the hope that People will want to buy it when you finally manufacture it a year later. Yeah. So it is. It is a massive risk. Um, but on on the flip side, uh, when you do get to that manufacturing stage and you've got a product which is sellable, um, then you hopefully start reaping the the returns. Fantastic, and, it, and it's going to be a fantastic journey in the next few years, I'm sure. But um, before we get into the future, let's delve into the past a little bit. I'm, I'm interested for you to just talk about maybe one of the mistakes, one of the challenges you've come across recently in your young entrepreneur life. Tell us the tale behind what went wrong, but then how you approached it 
how you turned it around and what you've learned since? Okay. I mean, um, I, I was really interested um, to sort of hear about this idea of looking at mistakes because usually people want to know like all about your successes and how well you've done and, and people are happy to talk about that. So it was, it was a bit of a challenge for me to think about, you know, what mistakes have, have I made because you try and almost block them out. But, you know, like you say, they're, they're just as valuable. Um, for me, I felt like with this business, a lot of my mistakes were made on the TV show, Be Your Own Boss. And for me, that kind of made those mistakes times 10 in the fact that they were going to be broadcast on TV and all your mates would see them. And that, that just, that for me made it a lot harder to make those mistakes and to accept them. Um, so, I mean, for example, uh, one, of, one of the first mistakes I made with the TV show um, was, was when they, they interviewed me on the first day of filming and they said to me, well, how did you, how did you meet your girlfriend? So I launched into this story, which I normally tell my, my mates all about how I was wasted on this night out and I don't remember it and I've downed this bottle of wine before going into the club. And then, uh, and then after the interview, uh, I was talking with my mentor and she said to me, you you know, you've, you've got to think about how you come across because you've, you've just told this drunken story TV camera and they can edit that however you like. So that was really, that first day of filming was really an eye opener for me um, to think before I speak. And, um, and then, I mean, the, the journey that we took over six weeks of filming with the TV show, um, I, I was turned down by who I thought at the time was, was our biggest customer for the product. I was turned down by them in front of the cameras. So, I mean, if, if you imagine making that phone call to the people who you're sort of banking on selling the most products to, and they turn around and say, oh, actually, we're not that interested. And to, you, I, I had to kind of instantly think, you think of thinking about the positive and try and how can I turn this around into a success, um, even though I've just been turned down by who I thought was my, my biggest customer. Um, so that that was really difficult, especially with with the the producer there sort of poking at you know how do you feel about this and you know what are you going to do next and in in reality you just want to sort of go in a room and sit down and have a good think about it but you have to just I found I just had to get straight on with it and you know from then we found okay we've been turned down by the the biggest customers in this country what are we going to do well we'll let's forget about this country and we'll focus on other countries abroad first because the market's much bigger there. Um, so it meant that that mistake, perhaps we launched into approaching that customer too fast and, and we should have taken a bit more time over it. Um, but I think if, if we wouldn't have been turned down by them, we would have perhaps started off smaller first, whereas by being turned down by them, it meant we had to look further afield and we had to find, we had to start speaking to the bigger market from the start because the, the guys in this country had turned us down. Um, so it was really a case of, okay, we've been turned down, what are we going to do, throw in the towel or, okay, let's carry on and let's, let's talk to some other people in South Africa or in Australia um, and, and see if you know, see if they want the product, and it, and it turns out they did. So, so that was brilliant. Um, and and for me, uh, another another mistake uh, during that TV process was was the meeting with Richard Branson. Um, I I was invited down to London by Richard Reed, um, the the founder of Smoothies. And I had no idea what I was going into. I, I got on the train um, and and went down there and. I was kept waiting for about five hours. They kept moving me from coffee shop to coffee shop. And, uh, and by the end of the day, you've got to remember at this point, I had no idea what I was walking into. So by the end of the day, I drank probably about six or seven cups of coffee and I was starting to, uh, to get a bit fidgety and didn't really know what was going on. And then eventually they pushed me into this room where there's Richard Reed, who introduces me to Richard Branson as well, which is absolutely amazing absolute dream for me but I soon realized that because I didn't know I was going into this meeting I was completely unprepared as well 
it's the kind of meeting where um, I had so many questions that I would have wanted to prepare and ask him and you know I, I could have made so much of, of that meeting but when you're sort of when you put on the spot um, you know you're, you you end up just sort of smiling and nodding lots and being like wow. <laughs> That's so cruel of him to do that because I mean that is like for any young entrepreneur a meeting like that is just the dream and exactly, you want to yeah. be prepared for something like that and to just be like Oh, he is Richard Branson. You must be... talk about being sort of stuck in awe. <laughs> exactly, proper rabbit in headlights. Uh. Right? Um, so, unfortunately for me, that was that was something which was out of my control as well. So I was I was really um, I was really in in their power. The, you know, the production team they were sort of deciding um, the the route my story would take. So that that was really you know on the spot, how can I make the most of this, um, and you know, I remember at one point, this was actually cut from the final edit, um, at one point uh, Richard Branson said to me, you know, what, what do you need, do you need more money, or you know, what, what can I do for you, and, and I, I look back on that moment and think, what if I would have said, a bit more money would be nice, that would, that would go a long way, but um, we we ended up talking about you know this international market and how we can how how we can reach a, a big market, and he he very kindly offered um, to to fly me and, and the watercraft out to Bondi Beach in Australia to help launch the product. So that that was absolutely amazing because now we've got we've got that which we're going to use to launch the business with. Um, so that was that was something I came away absolutely buzzing about. But I I do look back and think. If I if I would have known I was going into that, I I keep thinking about all these different ways I could have I could have made the most of that meeting, but um, but really we've we've in actual fact we've made the most of that meeting um, in the the PR that we've done after it, and the the real gift that Richard Branson gave to me and and the business was the use of his name. Yeah. And being able to talk about that meeting and talk about what he's given us to launch the business, that was that was real the um, the biggest gift um, from him. And so that was uh, so so looking back, um, you know, it perhaps wasn't as as terrible as I as I first thought. Yeah. Um, the impact he offers is so big, and everything that you said there, it just makes me think about the the world that we live in now because opportunities are around every corner there are so many of these tv shows where one minute you're just you know another young entrepreneur who's hustling and fighting and the next minute you appear in front of millions of people there's there's companies who launch on kickstarter and it goes viral and before you know it you're being interviewed on forbes magazine and mashable and all these things we we just never know when that big meeting or that big viral campaign that big pr thing's going to explode and I suppose the big thing I take from what you've just said there is, is being prepared, exactly. trying to not be that naive young pup who doesn't kind of know. And it can start from not telling a drunken story to, to making sure that you are ready to talk about your business in a sort of mature and rational manner at any point in the day to anybody. And to exactly. also, I suppose, doing your homework constantly so you're able to take advantage of everything but it's hard to to say that to someone you know like me for instance who's at the very beginning of the journey and in the mindset you're thinking oh well it's not going to happen now it might happen in six months but i'll be prepared by it by then but you just never know when it's going to come about and i'm guessing it yeah. all happened to you over the space of six seven eight weeks yeah yeah i was i was really thrown into it and i think um I think that just comes it comes with experience. I think all you can do is throw yourself into these situations and um, whether they go right or wrong um, and just sort of deal with it as it comes along. I mean, I've, I feel I've very much got a mentality that I throw myself into any, any opportunity that comes my way and, and fix it as you go along. Um, you know, you you might not, for example, I, I didn't know how to design a watercraft, um, but I just went for it and figured it out as I went along. And I'm still learning now as well. Um, so I I feel very much that you you just have to almost um, 
say yes to as many things as you can and they'll evolve and you'll you'll figure out how to do something um as as you're in it and as you're speaking to people um so no yeah i agree with you but that that you've got to be uh, you've got to be ready sort of 24/7 to um to do that sort of elevator pitch i guess yeah absolutely and has it kind of made you approach business in a different way now because i'm i'm guessing these experiences in the last sort of 6 months a year has has matured you you know, tenfold. You you just probably feel so much more comfortable now in front of a camera, being thrust yeah, yeah. into that you know once in a lifetime opportunity where you just have to react. You can't really teach someone that. It's it's just got to be learned with experience. And I liken it to a it. to a footballer. They can have all the skill in the world when they're seventeen, but they can't expect to have the same mentality and maturity as someone who's twenty eight because you can't teach experience. It's just something that happens. But I suppose you've learned so much from that. Have you kind of taken a step back from your business and thought, right, I need to know more about this and I need to make sure I've always got this kind of information on my phone or my iPad or I just always have to be a little bit prepared just in case? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, one of the things I really found um, during that sort of, you know, during the last six months of being thrown into the business world um, I I really found that I can't do everything myself, and you have to you have to realise what your strengths and your weaknesses are, and be happy to let other people um, do things which you haven't got time for, and and that for I think um, a, a thing which entrepreneurs often suffer of is that they want to be in control of everything and they want to do everything themselves. Um, I mean, a, an example for me was that um, before the before Be Your Own Boss went on TV, we, we didn't have a website for the business. We didn't have any sort of online presence. So we had two weeks between finishing filming and the program going on TV um, where I had, to, I had to put together a, a website. And, uh, and my idea of how I was going to do it was I was going to learn how to design a website, learn how to uh, code and do it all myself. Um, and my mentor sort of sat down with me. I'm, I'm really lucky to have a mentor at Loughborough University. She sat down with me and said, "You, you know, you can't do everything yourself. You'll end up doing. You'll end up designing a website which is crummy and which is not very well designed." So it was a real eye opener that oh, maybe, maybe, maybe I should give it to a website designer who can actually do it in the two weeks. Um, so I've. Yeah, that was that was a big eye opener for me to let other people do stuff and trust people with your business and ideas as well. And it is hard in the beginning because most of us start out a business, even if you have ambitions to one day be in charge of you know a thousand staff members. You usually start it on your own, money's tight, and at some point, all of a sudden, people are offering you money, and you know it, you you're always cautious. You think, no, I, I need to do stuff by myself because I'm not there yet, and this money I've got to make last for so long and you are you're, you're very precious about your little world and exactly ooh, will I be able to get this person to understand my vision and it, it is hard but if you want to grow and if you want to be I suppose a successful entrepreneur you have to learn to delegate give stuff up and I suppose release money in a wise manner it's not a case of throwing it away but yes this is going to make more sense Rather than me spending the next week learning how to create a website, it's going exactly. to be much more cost effective yeah. to pay someone to do it. Probably, yeah. Probably, yeah. <laughs> and time, time better spent, I think. Absolutely. And I, as someone who's kind of delved into the world of trying to make websites, I think it's a gift you either have or you don't. You can learn so much, but it's, it's a tough world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, and... And uh, yeah, like you say, um, I think you've got to you've got to trust people. And I and I also try and um, try and make sure I just have that reality check every now and then, and sort of look back and think, you know, what's what's the downside of this, and try and take a step back. And like we spoke about earlier, that um, I try and tell myself, you know, even if this product doesn't work, everything I'll learn from taking these steps. I'll be able to apply to to the next products, which might be the one which really does well. 
I, um, I think I've, I try and be really realistic about it and especially, um, you know, when I'm talking to my friends, uh, you know, I, I might say to them, um, you know, I realize that this product might not work and um, I'm very realistic about it that, you know, someone might beat me to market on the product and do it better. So in that case, you know, I've got to, I've got to constantly be thinking, well, what if that happens? If that happens, well, it's okay because... I know how to get a product to market now, so we can easily do it for the next one or for for another idea that I've got. Um, so it's it's really um, I see it as you know as as a learning process as well. That because if everything goes tits up, then it, you know you've you've learned so much that you can just repeat that again and hopefully next time don't make the mistakes that you made the first time constantly learning and evolving and I think we can all learn something from this in a sense of you know just being prepared not just for the rainy days which I guess we all get taught to do you know make sure you set some money aside and make sure you're yeah. mischievous yeah. but be prepared for the for the boom days because you yeah. never know when that tv show will come knocking and say will you appear you never know when something you do will go viral and every news outlet in the world wants a piece of you and that covers everything from making sure that you've got the necessary means to move up in hosting so your website doesn't crash, to making sure you've got your eleva elevator pitch down, to make sure. sure you're prepared and you understand your business. And it's all these little things which are hard to comprehend when you're at the beginning of your journey, but time and time again, it happens to people and it's happened to you. And it's, it's obviously a good thing. We want to go viral. We want the TV shows. We want that exposure, but yeah. you also want to knock it out of the park. I mean that's that's really interesting. Something you've hit on there that um, you I think people as in you, in yourself you need to define what success is going to be for you because um, for for some people success is making millions and millions of pounds. For other people, success might be um, you know it might be sort of uh, starting a family and um, and and buying a, a new car. Um, so. I, I think for everyone, success is going to be different, and and I certainly found this, um, you know, after the the TV show and and getting to meet Sir Richard Branson, um, a, a lot of people around me were saying, oh, you know, you've you've done so well and you've you've made it, and I didn't feel like that at all. I felt like it was really the beginning, um, and it was interesting that um, people. People around me, from what they'd seen, um, it looked like I was I was succeeding and doing really well. But in actual fact, in myself, I felt like I'd I was only just beginning, and this I've still got so much more to do. So I was almost I was almost shocked when people were saying, "Oh, you've you've done really well," and I was almost telling them, "No, I haven't. You know, I've got I still got so more much There's more so much to do." <laughs> um, so I I I did. I, I guess, if I'm honest, I, I found it difficult dealing with success as well, um, and especially um, how, especially that difference between what people see and what is actually happening. Because what you know, obviously, what you what you see on a TV program is not necessarily what really happened, and it might it, it's not necessarily um, shown in the order of how things happen. And it's uh, you know it's it's a producer's take on on a story, so I I found it quite difficult to to deal with. Um, as soon as that TV show had finished, um, that had been my world and everything I did sort of twenty four seven for six weeks, and then as suddenly it was over, and I was back to back to my day job, back at work, back in that routine of nine till five, and it was it was really difficult to handle because. <clears throat> Literally a, a couple of days before, I'd been in Richard Reed's office pitching to him, and then the following Monday, I was back at work doing my day job. And the worst thing was, I wasn't able to talk about it with anyone because I'd signed this contract with the BBC confidentiality. And um, so it was it was really surreal, and it was it was difficult to handle as well because I went back to went back to work with with no money because I hadn't been paid for the six weeks. Um, and I wasn't allowed to talk about it, and I'd also not got the investment from Richard Reed. So I'd almost gone away, and I was in my in my imagination and head. I was hoping I'd come back as this big success story, that I'd come back and quit my job, and I'd got investment from Richard Reed. Um, 
but actually on the final day I, I never got the investment and I ended up going back to work um, and it also you know it, it almost didn't go for plan to plan for me um, so it was a uh, the few weeks after finishing uh, that final pitch on the TV show, it was I, I really had I had to spend like a few weeks just getting my head together and thinking, you know, where are we going next? Because um, I failed on the on getting that big investment, and this is going to go on TV. You and know, everyone saw you on TV, and they're saying, "You're you've made it. You're a success. You're a big star now." And you're like. No, I'm not. yeah, exactly. I'm not. <laughs> exactly. Um, so it, yeah, it was it was it was quite it was quite difficult to to deal with at times, both with the with the failing to get that big investment on TV, and also with the the success that we did. You know that we managed to turn around a, a product in six weeks and have something ready to pitch. Um, so it was. It was difficult dealing with the success and the failure, um, and and I mean, what was what was interesting is um, when I when I went back to work after after the TV show, my my boss sat me down and we had a good chat, and um, we were we both sort of said that um, I think people in in the UK um, see success as someone see failure even as almost a disease sometimes, and they. They often look at people that have failed and think they've got some sort of disease and it's going to rub off on them. Uh, and he, my boss, he works a lot in, in America, uh, and he said people in America seem to have a much better attitude of failure. And it seems for some reason the, the Americans have this attitude of, oh, just you know, get, pick yourself up and, and start again, um, whereas... Um, the, the UK can have this real anti to failure and um, but you know like like we've discussed failure can be really good because the the TV show was was certainly the best thing that I've ever done and it's it's made it so the people that I wanted to speak to about the product and were going to help me to get it to manufacture they came to me rather than me having to go knocking on doors so it really kind of put myself out there and all those people that I was begging to get meetings with before, now they're coming to me asking for the meetings. So if I wouldn't have done that, then I probably wouldn't have carried on with, with the product and the business. So um, it, it almost didn't matter if I failed or succeeded. At the time, it felt like I'd failed on national TV. But looking back, um, if anything, I think I think that helped me because people saw me fail and thought, oh, I can help you, so got in touch. Um, well, it's been a fantastic journey. I'm sure it'll continue to um, be that way for the coming years, and there'll be ups and downs, but it, it sounds like the TV show has bred to some great things. Before we leave, and to just summarise on a few things, because I'm guessing there'll be people watching this who, have it, who will be a, going on a TV show or a popular online internet show or, you know, doing something which has the potential of going viral, if, if you were to just summarise on a couple of points, what would you recommend to these people to be prepared and to, I guess, make the most out of that opportunity? I mean, I guess I guess the the best advice I'd give is just, is just be completely honest and, and just, um, you know, just be honest and true to yourself. And I think, if, en if anything, like the camera never lies. So if you're if you truly believe in your product or service or business, um, then then it will show. And you just need to know know the business and know uh, yourself inside out um, before you go into something like this. Um, and and just practice as well. Just talk to everyone about your business and talk to everyone about your ideas. And I think I find, especially in in the product design world. Uh, people are very secretive about their business and ideas because they think people are going to steal from them. Um, whereas I, I try and take the opposite approach and be completely open to to all my friends, family, and you know everyone I meet, and I want to tell everyone about it. Um, and by doing that, you practice with those people your pitch, and and the more practice you have, the better you get. So my my advice would be just um, just tell everyone about it and tell everyone about how great it is, um, and 
sooner or later we'll catch on. And then when you meet Richard Branson, you can blow him out of the water with this, <laughs> this conversation you've had about a thousand times with your friends down at the pub, but now exactly. you're you yeah, counting exactly. for something. As long as you don't get bored of telling the same story, yeah. <laughs> you can go the other way. Well, thank you very much, Ross. It's been an absolute pleasure, and it's been so interesting because it does show a different side to that successful TV world where people do think, oh, it's the ultimate success, and it does bring them successes but there are pitfalls and there are so much we can learn from things like that so thank you very much for joining me thank you and and, and good luck with the book as well i'm sure it's it's going to be a success it's been a great journey so far and indeed viewer thank you for watching hopefully you've picked up a few tips or two and they're going to go away and scratch down some notes so until next time cheers and there you have it another session of the purple coffee podcast at an end and what a wonderful insight from the lovely Ross Kemp. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Ross for being part of both this podcast and my book, The Successful Mistake. It's been an amazing journey I've gone down and I've interviewed a hundred plus entrepreneurs by now or now after their great mistake and each and every time I'm blown away. You might think some of the stories are the same, but they are all completely different. And for me, it demonstrates how powerful storytelling is. So what about Ross and that juicy mistake of his? I mean, this is a guy who's met people like Richard Reed and Richard Branson, big time entrepreneurs who you want to impress. He's appeared on the BBC at a show which was watched by millions. This is a fantastic opportunity where people go to his website, check out his Facebook page, call him up and ask him to be interviewed and all these things. And he didn't quite take it with two open hands. At the time, sure, he thought he did, but he shared the wrong stories. He focused on the wrong things. And although it has turned out okay in the end, because people like Richard Branson understand young folk aren't gonna have it all sorted out up here, not everybody will be as sympathetic. And I love that Ross has taken a step back from his business, thought about the big picture, and really realized how he wants to come across as an individual, as an entrepreneur, and as a man leading a brand into the future. This is something I'm sure you can take a great deal from. You never know when that big article is going to go viral. You never know when you're going to meet that person who can change your life. You never know when that big opportunity will come calling. So right now, I want you to take a step back from your business and think, what would I do? What stories would you share? How would you want to come across? What things would you focus on? Would it be about all money and projections and ROI? Or would you be looking at the bigger picture and focusing on things like your values and your vision? This is what Ross did and I think it set him in good stead. He's got a fantastic product which will take him down fantastic roads, but they won't all be plain sailing. And yes, that is a bit of a purposeful pun considering his product. So I hope you take a lot from this interview. I'm sure you have. And be sure to check out Ross and ASAP Watercrafts in the links below. It's a fantastic product. I'm so excited to see this girl. And I think in another five years, every time you go to the beach, you're gonna see one of these things. And the fact it's gonna save lives, man, it touches my heart. So there you have it, my kind listener slash viewer, another session of the Purple Coffee podcast at an end. So what can you do now? Well, if you like to watch things with your eyes, I encourage you to follow the Vimeo page. Whereas if you like to listen, maybe via iTunes, well, I encourage you to subscribe to that channel. And you can also sign up to my email list and receive these episodes before everybody else and also don't forget to check out the success from mistake because it's something i hope you'll be part of oh yes oh yes how do you do this well i've provided a little bitly link and it is bitly forward slash purple coffee 16 it'll take you to this session's blog page and you will have all those links in a nice handy place so be sure to check that out check out Russell's world and that's all I have to say so I'm going to stop chatting now and wasting oxygen and I'm going to wish you a very lovely rest of the day and until next time keep it cool you crazy little misfit